Hello, everyone. How y'all doing? We're good? Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to the Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design. We are thrilled to continue our fiction series investigations by considering the nuanced, timely, and prescient voice of artist Cecile B. Evans with her presentation titled Lecture Feeling for You. Cecile's work explores the influence of new technologies on human feelings and behavior and takes the multi-form structure and shape of sculpture, video and video installations, internet platforms, and performances. A Belgian-American currently based in London, selected exhibitions of her work have been included at the Casteo de Rivoli Turin, Museum Leuven, Tate Liverpool, Museum of Modern Art Paris, and the Berlin Biennial. Public collections of her work are held at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Rebel Family Collection in Miami, and the Whitney Museum of American Art, among others. In the context of our series, Cecile's work illuminates the ways the ubiquity of technology in our daily lives increasingly solidifies the notion that the virtual is part of the real. Her work reflects on the values of emotions in contemporary society by exploring forms of human subjectivity and the systems that carry them, as well as the limits of both. Although she's an artist working in various mediums, tonight's presentation will focus on her most recent films in particular. She'll guide us through these works with a kind of hyperlinked logic often used in her projects, not unlike an internet rabbit hole or a kind of reverse engineering of her own practice. This digital constellation will link personal anecdotes to research, to images, to audience reactions, to video clips, giving us an intimate look at the sources and rationale behind the artist's multi-dimensional artworks, as well as the opportunity to reflect on our own fraught, fascinating, and often tenuous feelings for technology. It is my pleasure to welcome Cecile B. Evans. Thank you, Gretchen, for the lovely introduction and the very, very warm welcome to my first trip to Denver. As Gretchen mentioned, I work across many different mediums, but I'm mostly going to focus on the, vi the videos or core projects that behave in a similar way to the videos. Gretchen also mentioned a hyperlinked style, and I will add a disclaimer. I am a human and not a machine. And I also understand that you are humans and not machines. There will be a lot of information in the next hour, and I will make mistakes. I might be wrong, and I may even fail. That is part of what makes me human and what makes the machines that we build familiar to us. So, as a bit of background, um, I actually trained as an actor. I studied theater, and when I transitioned to being a visual artist, um, what really stayed with me is an interest in feelings, um, but also the way that we exchange emotion, the way that we circulate it, the way that it passes through different systems and structures. And I like to start um, recently with this quote from the filmmaker and visual artist Chris Marker, and this is from his film Sans Soleil. He claims that electronic texture is the only one that can deal with sentiment, memory, and imagination. So this quote is kind of a poetic way um, to talk about what I believe has been one of the most significant impacts on emotion and the systems that affect them in the last 20 to 30 years, which is digital technology. So this has deepened my research so that now I'm more specifically interested in the governance and rebellion of human emotions as they come into contact with these technological and very physical structures that try to rationalize or streamline them. So I'll start with Agnes. Agnes is a spam bot. She was commissioned by the Serpentine Galleries in London. She lives on the internet and is an interactive web interface. So her primary function was that she wanted to know more about your feelings, but also to share hers. And around this time, which was like 2012, 2013, there was a real focus um, from tech companies or like a push to develop products that 
would know how you feel and mirror that back to you. So really honing in on this exchange between machines and humans and forging that relationship. So one of the first steps that I took when I was researching this project is that I visited uh, Cambridge University in the UK, their affective computing lab. And basically, affective computing is just the programming of computers to recognize how we're feeling, but also to mirror that back to us or replicate a different emotion to start that relationship going. And the programmers at the lab, for the most part, are working in uh, research for autism. So for people who maybe don't have a rub like a rubric or a set of understanding of how to read emotions or how to communicate them. But I still wanted to ask them how exactly they were going to categorize feelings, because I know in my case, I really have no idea what's going on half the time. Um, and they talked about something I'd come across, which was Darwin's book from the 1870s called The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. And Darwin was making this assumption of a human universality that I believe has plagued modern and contemporary existence. So this idea that all humans and apparently some animals exhibit similar emotional behavior. So this is problematic, right? I mean, it's really useful when thinking in educational terms, but um, if you look at this, this is his categorization of how people or what people look like when they express grief. They're all white. We can assume that they're more or less from a very specific region. This idea of like a biased data set is something that really influenced me from the beginning. Another thing that I came across quite early um, is this Mechanical Turk, which is an 18th century automaton. It was one of the first interactive automated human figures. So you would walk up to it, um, you were told that it was a machine, and you would play chess with it. Um, but it was pretty soon revealed that it was not actually an automaton, but apparently a very small person inside of a box. And they would be manipulating through these wires and playing chess with you, probably through like a periscope or something. So I call this an artificial, artificial intelligence. Um, but I think one thing that is really interesting and that I also have carried with me is this idea of the human inside the machine because humans make machines, and uh, humans and their desires make these machines. So these machines will always carry this human element with them. And I always try and remember that. But back to Agnes, to simply describe what she did. So she would ask users how they were feeling, and based on their response, it would kind of launch a sort of choose-your-own-adventure journey through the internet. She would talk to you um, about an employee at the galleries, for example, or her cat, microchipped, who lived in the basement. Or she could also ask you any number of very personal questions, like, what are you most afraid of dying from? Or do you want children, and why or why not? To push this relationship as far as I could and really take the proposition seriously, I had Agnes conduct her own interviews so that the project really remained from her perspective and not mine as this kind of like authority about artificial intelligence. So this is an interview she did with the director of the Serpentine Galleries. Um, this went on for many years very explicit about her limitations. For example, these are tweets from users who received presents in the mail after giving their home addresses as a token for experiencing one of Agnes's shortcomings. So this would be a moment where she was unable to identify with a user based on the information that she has access to, or rather the information that she doesn't have access to. At some point, Agnes was invited to participate in an exhibition in Germany, not me. So I created a video essay for her called Agnes, the End is Near. And basically, it's that Agnes has overheard someone at the Serpentine Gallery say that there will be an end to her. She will be replaced by another project and be moved off the front page. And this became a way to talk about technological obsolescence, right? So what happens to our data after it gets deleted? Where does it go? Does it just disappear? But also um, to really explore this thread of, of how we use artificial intelligences and technologies as a way to explore some of the murkier areas of humanity, like mortality, some of the things that we're maybe not comfortable facing, just human to human. 
So the Serpentine Galleries very generously invited Agnes back for a performance where we screened the video and also the curator asked her some questions live and the audience were able to ask her questions through a Google document. So I should state at this point that Agnes is very much an artificial, artificial intelligence. And during the performance, it was actually myself um, and a team of others who were mechanically operating her. So launching and firing off different voiceovers, answering the questions in the Google Doc. But it was incredible how easy this relationship was during the performance, right? Like nobody ever doubted that they were speaking to something or someone. And also by this point on the website, I generated tens of thousands of individual users' personal information and how readily they'd offered their interest and trust in this entity. So this was a book that I was reading during the research. It's by Microsoft Labs, which was right next to Cambridge University Labs. And there's this passage that describes a near future where everyone's grandmother and grandfather will have a storage drive with their memories and their day-to-day -day lives on it. And Microsoft was wondering how they could make this object reflect the value of what was inside. And I was wondering, after amassing tens of thousands of users' data, how much of us is really in these copies of ourselves, inside of this information, and how much of it is in us? Basically, what's that relationship? Um, and so this is obviously a clip from Peter Pan. Um, and I think it's a really great example of this split between the original and its double, or the original and its copy. So these are two very distinctly different things that are struggling with those differences, but they're still very much in the same space. And I wanted to make a project, a new project, that thinks about what happens if we stop trying to forge a connection between those two and examine the individual conditions of the copy. And one example that I found prevalent in popular culture is something called digital resurrection, which is basically when an actor passes away before a movie is completed, they create a digital or CGI copy of that actor. So this is Marlon Brando in Superman Returns in 2006, after he had passed. This is probably the most famous example when they brought back Tupac Shakur about a decade after he passed away as a hologram um, to perform at Coachella with Snoop Dogg. And this is Audrey Hepburn performing, or rather the copy of Audrey Hepburn, performing in a Galaxy chocolate commercial. As I was researching this, a very famous actor died. And it was an actor that I admired and felt that I had a very strong relationship to his image and his performances. It was also the first time that I had witnessed uh, what has become this routine grief ritual when a celebrity dies, that we try to deal with our relationship to them and their image. Um, and the production studio, so he was part of this one, a big blockbuster series that had to be completed, and the production studio announced pretty quickly that they were going to make a CGI model of him. A couple months passed, um, and an interview came out that I spotted uh, where the director of those movies came out and said in no uncertain terms that there would absolutely not be a CGI copy of this actor. And there was something about the language that he used. It was really strong, words like disgusting and distressing and stuff like that. And between that and the time that had elapsed between that first article and the second one, I just started to think, like, what if they did actually make a copy of him and it failed miserably and it just couldn't do what it was meant to do and serve as a placeholder for the original. So I made that bad copy because I thought this would be an interesting perspective to speak from, right? The thing that's not doing what humans want it to do. So this is Phil, and he is the protagonist or narrator of a video called Hyperlinks or It Didn't Happen. Um, and he talks about the conditions of his existence, but he also introduces you to characters like an invisible woman who's been erased from the landscape or photoshopped out. You find out basically because of her age. You also meet her partner who joins her at the site of her erasure. And Phil and the couple, um, so they often discuss Ralph Ellison's book Invisible Man, which is about the invisible labor of black Americans during the Industrial Revolution. These characters do not aim to represent that struggle, but this was a case where I just really wanted to acknowledge a wider history of invisibility and technology. So Agnes is also in this video. 
And through her, there's a discussion about the forgotten women of computer programming. So this is a 1960s article from Cosmopolitan magazine um, that says basically that programming is women's work um, because in order to be a good programmer, it's like planning a dinner party. You need um, to have a good math skills, you know, recipes, and also have a high level of attention to detail. So as computers became more and more important and were considered more and more serious, these jobs uh, for women got replaced by men, and uh, they were basically erased from this history. To the extent that a lot of the books that I came across, they would show pictures of these women in front of the computers and say that they were fashion models who were there to display the units. You also meet Yuana Haku, um, who is a Japanese holographic pop star based on a real Japanese holographic pop star. And in the story, she's sent on a hard drive to Dubai as a soft approach to politics. And another thing that's come up many times um, across several works is this idea of the marginalized body as a vessel for other people's desires, but also like political means, and the symbolism that that carries in the way that those, those bodies are deployed. So a very recent example of this is the character Rachel in Blade Runner 2049 who's played by a digitally rendered version of a young Sean Young, who is the actress who played the original Rachel in the 1980s film Blade Runner. This is interesting because this is more or less one of the first examples of someone who's replaced by a copy of themselves while they're still alive. And she used this intelligently as an opportunity to talk about the discrimination that she experienced on set and also about the conditions of, of invisibility as a woman in Hollywood. So the final character that I'll briefly mention, because there are a lot of characters in the video, is a young man who is haunted by his dead girlfriend on Facebook. So a lot of existential questions that then spilled out and over into the installation. So this is an installation view of how the work is usually displayed. And each of these sculptures, um, I try to use them to expand on a theme that's touched upon within the video. So, at the end of making this work, I had another blind spot. The question remained um, that I really didn't manage to address in that video, which is who is behind all of this? So there are these structures that are causing these conditions, but basically, who's in charge? And at that time in Europe, we were watching images of Greece literally on fire. And there was this discussion um, of the possibility that democracy could die in its birthplace. There was also this quote floating around. Um, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism that's been attributed to a few people. Um, and who's in charge of these large structures it has become so obfuscated and unclear that it's easier to imagine destroying our material world than to find, track down, and hold accountable the people who control its demise. So at the time, this is four of the eight wealthiest people in the world who are the heads of technology companies. And at this moment, these companies are starting to launch services that move beyond the basic intimate social relationships and are aiming for more ideological goals. So this is an image from Facebook's launch of an internet service to bring free Wi-Fi to third world countries. So they were going to launch this in several countries in Africa and also India. And India, famously, via the India Times, rejected this freedom in the form of Wi-Fi because you could only be free and recognized on the internet if you subscribed to Facebook. This pointed to this problematic situation where now you have a corporation who's deciding basically who does and doesn't exist within a space. This is also a time, um, well, this is much more recent, but uh, it was definitely brewing then, where these technology corporations are getting closer and closer to government and the political sphere. And as someone pointed out this year when Mark Zuckerberg uh, stood in front of Congress, and he often talked about across from the beginning of Facebook, um, this idea of a greater good and working towards a greater good and that being the mission, and that he wanted to ensure that Facebook would be used for good, which is really freaking scary to think that, you know, these are the people deciding. And as I pointed out, the bottom one is a tweet that I made that was never forget that Zuckerberg originally created the platform to rate college girls' faces. 
Speaking of faces and scandals, this was one of the many situations that Google found themselves in because of their Google image search. And it's another example of what I was talking about earlier, which is systemic bias or like a biased data set. Um, and so you would search for either unprofessional or professional hair. And as you may have figured out on the left, you came up with a lot of pictures of women of color with natural hair, and on the right, a lot of white women with straightened hair. So this is a moment in which technology fails, and the cycle of us shaping our tools, or rather these CEOs shaping our tools, and thereafter the tools shaping us, and this cycle is becoming more and more of a closed loop. And Sherry Turkle, who's a technologist, says the product is no longer for you, it is you. And I was looking at corporate branding documents, and most of them expressed that the company or brand should be human, or feel human, or that the ultimate goal was, was to have a human brand. And this reminded me of a small section of law, of corporate law, called corporate personhood, which basically says that a corporation has access to the same rights as a human being. For example, if the corporation has certain religious rights, uh, religious beliefs, then they have the right to refuse certain kinds of medications like birth control to their employees. I wanted to get past all of this um, and create a world where things like capitalism, neoliberalism, the World Wide Web, democracy, they're all gone. They've all ended and they've been replaced by a new system, a human system called hyper. So Hyper is the protagonist of the video, What the Heart Wants, and this is an image of the installation at the ninth Berlin Biennial. And at the center of the work is this question, what does it mean to be and who gets to be a person in the future? And who or what gets to make those decisions? And I'll show you one more very concrete and pretty hardcore example um, of a computer making that decision. Hey, hold on. <laughs> and the worst part is I bought one for Christmas. <laughs> I hope my wife doesn't see this YouTube video, but I bought the same computer I'm and we can't even computer. use, look, it's not following me. It's not, Wanda, get back in the frame. It follows look. me wherever I go. Yeah, so they've fixed that bug, but I'm sure we'll be encountering many others. So to go through a few of the characters in this video, these are the lovers who love freely. They are lovers not because of any sexual orientation, but because the system doesn't see them as faces, and that is what allows them to love freely. They live off the grid. This is Ear Ear, uh, who is part of a workers' collective of ears, and they mine the pink algae that feeds the system. The blob uh, that you see is a HeLa cell, which is based on a real cell, the immortal cells of Henrietta Lacks, who was a black woman who died in the 1950s of cervical cancer. The medical doctors, uh, they harvested her cells for research, and they call them immortal cells because basically um, across multiple decades, they continued to mutate and change. They never died. Um, and scientists were able to create tens of, or thousands of patents and actual cures for diseases. And sometime around the 70s, they tracked down a member of the family, called them, and said, uh, hi, we're from XYZ um, Medical Research Lab, like, thank you so much for your contribution to science, or whatever they say on the phone. And uh, the family was like, who are you? They had not bothered to get consent. So this is something that was core to the project, um, and I fortunately, I had the privilege of speaking with the director of research on a regular basis from the Future of Humanity Institute, because, you know, it can't all be bad, right? There's a reason that we all have these devices um, and that we enjoy them on a regular basis. But there is this question of, um, is progress worth it when it's at the sake of something else or at the consequence of something else? And one of the things that um, we spoke about that actually made it into the video is something called the trolley problem. And the trolley problem starts that there are five people tied to a set of tracks, and there's a lever that you can pull to derail the train, but it will kill one person standing next to the tracks. Do you intervene and kill someone on purpose, or do you let that accident happen and kill five people, or let five people die? 
Um, it goes on to say that there's another scenario where there is no lever, but there's a very large person next to the tracks, and if you push them onto it while the train is going, it will actually stop the train and save the five people's lives. And then another one where that large person is actually the one who tied those people to the tracks in the first place, and then you get into an argument about judgment calls of what is who or what is good and who is bad and who deserves to live. So there are like multiple scenarios where this could happen, where, you know, different things could happen, and that there are consequences for each. And I began to become very curious to understand what is that feeling, to be aware of all of the options and all of the problems, and how does this become paralytic? I want to acknowledge that the impact that dig digital technology has had on evolution and how humans are much more aware of things and problems that are really big and really far away, but we haven't necessarily been able to develop a skill set to do something with that information on a person-to-person -person basis on a wide scale. So I mean everyone in this room. How can we begin to acknowledge the physicality of these movements, so the physical presence of these scenarios? I wanted to make a companion piece around the same time as What the Heart Wants that existed on a more traditionally physical space to trace how emotion moves through space and how we deal with it. So this was also the time where there were platforms like Periscope and Facebook Live that were being launched, um, where basically you can zoom into different locations to see people live streaming, what's going on in their lives. Um, and I happened to tune in um, during the Turkish coup. So I could actually zoom in on different cities in Turkey um, and see m what was happening and try to figure out what was going on. And I remember feeling this strange sense of participation. So I was having feelings about what was happening very far away from me without an emotional experience of it happening to me directly. They also, um, Facebook also launched the safety check-in, which many of you probably know. Um, if a natural disaster or a terrorist incident happens, you can check yourself in as safe. Again, if you're not on Facebook, we don't know if you're safe or not. But also, what they didn't think about is that this is real. This is all real. And they didn't think about um, how you would receive that information or what context you would receive that in or what were the next steps. They also started um, adding the function that we all use now where like emojis fly across the screen um, when you're watching different videos. So this is when the uh, terrorist incident in Berlin happened. And at the time we didn't know that it was a terrorist incident, but Facebook made that call on their own. So how things were playing out across tools like social media didn't necessarily sync up with the physical realities they were tied to. And it certainly didn't account for the very physical experience of receiving this information. At the time, it was happening so often that it felt like nearly every day was enveloped in some kind of hysteria cycle or loop. And these cycles would spread very quickly. So this was another book that I was reading. Uh, it was written in the 1990s. It's a sociological study called Emotional Contagion. And it basically says, if I'm sad, I'm standing next to you, chances are I will also make you sad. And that that can be passed on from one person to another. And again, Facebook, just because they're so easy to pick on. They, uh, a couple years ago, did a study on, multi on millions of uh, Facebook users without their consent called the Experimental Evidence of Massive Scale Emotional Contagion Through Social Networks. So similarly, I post something sad, maybe you participate in my sadness through commenting, and it makes you more likely to share sad things also. Um, which basically is just a way also to keep you on the platform constantly, because feelings are addictive. That's why we love reality television, or why I do. So these events and emotions are being circulated and moved through space in a way that isn't the most efficient. It's more beneficial towards financial gain. So what I ended up creating is called Sprung a Leak. It's an automated play in three acts about how three robots, two humanoid robots and one robot dog, work with a chorus of three human users to deal with the system that surrounds them as it leaks and moves information and emotionally charged information to and through them. So these are the two humanoid robots. They're called Pepper Robots. Um, this is the robot dog. This is an example of one of the human users that appears through a screen. 
And the title comes from the Jailer's Daughter monologue in Two Noble Kinsmen by Shakespeare. And the monologue describes the moment at which emotion begins to overwhelm the character and it crushes her. And it uses this metaphor of a ship crashing against rocks. Um, so I took this in one hand, um, you know, this paralytic feeling of, uh, emotion, of multiple emotions at once, but also the failure of technology. So ship is a kind of technology. It helps to do something that our bodies can't do. Um, and as I mentioned at the very start, failure is a huge part of technology and it's what makes it feel the most human. So one of the main events in the play is the appearance of a character called Liberty, a beauty blogger with no arms, whom both the humans and robots fall in love with. Their anxiety and fear rises as it becomes clear that Liberty's life is at stake. She dies and undies several times across the three acts, a lot of fake news, even going back in time with the dog to where it all began. Liberty was based on a real person, very loosely based, um, called Marina Joyce, who's based in the UK. She's a beauty blogger. Her videos aren't that interesting. Um, she talks about, you know, clothes that have been sent to her, her cat, her daily life. She's a little spaced out a lot of the time, which is fine. Um, but this sort of made some space for people in the comments section um, to start hypothesizing, and all these conspiracy theories started to arise about how she had been kidnapped, she was being abused, how she had actually died and been replaced by an actor. And this hysteria got so fervent that the local police actually went to her house to check that she was fine and had to issue a public statement saying that, yeah, she's alive, she's well. This didn't really stop people. Um, just thought I'd share quickly, this is what the robots look like when they're moving. They're doing a little dance during intermission. Um, and I'm really sorry for this picture. But it's the only, I saw this posted yesterday and it's the only um, place I could find this slogan uh, in an image. Um, but one of the major components in hysteria and contagion is time and how time is perceived. And social media's decision to move away from chronological timelines, it messes with our feelings, but it also contributes to our lack of understanding what a potential beginning, middle, or end to these events might be. So the play itself actually ends on a loop. It stops very abruptly, the robots all go back to their places, the play begins again. So I've now talked about a few different projects, all that end in this question mark. And we artists are kind of famous for saying things like, um, oh, my job is to ask questions, it's not to give answers. But I started to get a little frustrated with myself and in general about the lack of answers. What do we do? <laughs> Um, and I want to share with you uh, a commercial that came out in the UK. It's from my bank, Lloyd's Bank. In a way it's all a matter of time I will not worry for you You'll be just fine You're not alone I'll wait till the end of time Open your mind Lloyd's Bank, by your side. Right, so we're still in the apocalypse, but we're no longer imagining it. We're embracing it, and we have banks to help us get through it. The New York Times starts to release several articles that glibly talk about how to survive the apocalypse, how to shop the apocalypse, how rich people are buying up huge swathes of land um, to, to build like future underground cities or whatever. Um, Arcade Fire, the band, releases an album that basically says, hey, 
let's party all the way to the apocalypse. But who is offering a solution for those of us that don't want to embrace the collapse of civilization, or who quite like literally can't afford to? Well, Facebook again, they had a problem. Their system was collapsing, and here's what they said that we should do in the face of their collapse. We came here for the friends. And we got to know the friends of our friends. And then our old friends from middle school, our mom, our ex, and our boss joined forces to wish us happy birthday. And we discovered our uncle used to play in a band and realized he was young once too. And we found others just like us. And just like that, we felt a little less alone. But then something happened. We had to deal with spam, clickbait, fake news, and data misuse. That's going to change. From now on, Facebook will do more to keep you safe and protect your privacy, so we can all get back to what made Facebook good in the first place. Friends. Because when this place does what it was built for, then we all get a little closer. When this place does what it was built for, then we all get a little closer. So Facebook is saying that the solution is A, to use more Facebook, and B, basically the problem is not Facebook. The problem is the people who don't use it the way it was built. In fact, since the advent of digital technology, its rise in the ranks of capitalism and the consequences of an increasingly divided existence, the loudest voices in the mainstream offering solutions and liberation left and right are wealthy, white, Western, and male our so-called troubled geniuses. And you'll notice that one of them has passed away, but I've kept him in there because he is very significant. Um, and also to show you, um, it was actually, I think, Apple's first advertisement. It was in response to IBM's Think Different campaign. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. So these are promises to ward off dystopia by presenting images of dystopia. They were also promising to liberate their customers. They promised freedom. So I was someone in the early 2000, uh, 2000s who believed in that promise. I bought an iPod. I still own a MacBook Pro. And man, I want to cash my check in for a revolution. I'm ready for that freedom. <laughs> it's not happening. But with this project that I was about to embark on, uh, I didn't want to focus on a system or a company, a government, or a large body. I really wanted to begin to address the human figures that are really gatekeeping these systems, those who could change things but are unable to change themselves. I started to develop Amos's world that used the archetype of the troubled white male genius as a starting point. This is Amos, the architect. He's played by a puppet. I stepped away from the more obvious network of the World Wide Web and looked to other promises made by these troubled genius creators of perfect individual communal structures. I started to look at housing complexes, places that, similarly to our computers and media networks, were vast sites of feelings, emotions, and memories, people's homes. I specifically turned to one man, the godfather of an ideological architectural movement called brutalism, who, through his concept of an interconnected city within a building, created large housing complexes where people were individuals that are identified by a community that was built for them, and within which all areas of life could be addressed. He also promised to bring people the basic pleasures of life, to be free and to be a part of others who also, who also feel free. But the more I read his writings, the more Le Corbusier's plan for a city within a building began to sound like the society within a network that the architects of the internet had been promising, including the familiar tinge of distrust in its users. So this is Le Corbusier in 1933. He says, we cannot leave millions of men, women, and young people to spend seven or eight hours a day on the street. 
we, I, are faced with the urgent task of creating living quarters capable not only of containing people that live in them, but also, and above all, of retaining them. So we don't trust people, we need to get them here, but also keep them here. Le Corbusier's ideology for design really began to take off after the Second World War, when large networked housing complexes began to spring up all over the world. Each time they were built big, promised big things, and each time they nearly always failed. So this is an image of a building right near where I live in London that's currently being demolished in front of the tenants, so they're doing it section by section. One of the building's architects, Peter Smithson, very quickly in the 70s, blamed the building's failures on the tenants. Basically, they didn't know how to dispose of their garbage, their cooking smelled, they weren't good people, they were not like him. This is another uh, one of these buildings called Balfron Tower, which is also right next to where I live in London. Um, it was built by Erno Goldfinger, um, who, yes, was the name inspiration for the Bond villain. And he says, I built skyscrapers for people to live in, and now they messed them up. Disgusting. And I'm just going to cycle through a bunch of these buildings. I won't say too much about them. So this is Pruitt Igo, um, which is, was in the United States, torn down in the 1960s. The police wouldn't even go there. This is Ponte City, built in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, what you see in the courtyard is a stories high pile of garbage. Um, this is Sam Bunton's plan for a Manhattan skyline on the outskirts of Glasgow being demolished. And this is Naples' Vele de Scampia, or the sales of Scampia, um, which was also abandoned by the local police and is currently run by the local mafia. So I show these examples to really pin down the danger of elite projection. The belief that what relatively fortunate people find as attractive or convenient is good or correct for the rest of society as a whole, especially for their homes, the place where their memories live. So what about these troubled male genius types? Amos's World is a fictional television show about a socially progressive housing estate. The plot centers around Amos, an ambitious architect, and the supposedly perfect individual communal living structure he dreams of creating. His plans are complicated quite soon by a character called The Weather, who reveals that the building does exist and is failing. The tenants have been unable to conform to Amos's expectations. So who are these tenants? Or rather, we'll start with who the architect thinks these tenants are. The architects previously mentioned all had a basic assumption about a universal human, kind of like how Darwin did. The terms of this universality were clearly documented in standards manuals like this one that emerged as the industrial age progressed to help produce growth at a very rapid scale on a global scale. They collated hundreds of pages of data on the human being, how they might sit or bend over, the best width for a door to carry your suitcases through. They even, just like Tarwin, categorized the animals. This idea of a universal existence, when combined with this promised value of social good or progress, produces misunderstandings between a design and its user. So this is an earlier example called the Frankfurt Kitchen, um, which was created after the First World War um, with these measurements that promised the maximum efficiency for the maximum number of tasks so that women could be liberated and have more time to do other things, like possibly work. Um, but unfortunately, sometime later, people pointed out that they had made certain assumptions about a woman's shape and size, as well as the fact that you could only really fit one person in that kitchen. So it totally isolated her from the rest of the house and anyone else in the house. So another character is the secretary, um, and she is in this tradition of uh, the forgotten computer woman. She's based on um, a real secretary who, uh, Joseph Weizenbaum, who was the creator of the first supposedly emotional artificial intelligence called Eliza. There's this anecdote that gets trotted out in most documentaries about artificial intelligence, where he asked her to use Eliza and to speak with her, um, and that the secretary became so engrossed that when her boss came in, uh, she asked him to please leave the room. Uh, I called MIT, I wrote to them, um, they were really friendly, but no one could remember who this woman was, or they wouldn't give me any information. One person even speculated that she might not even exist. 
Uh, and then finally, um, a wonderful professor called Joel Moses said, I don't remember her name, but I looked through my scrapbook and I found this picture of her. But at this point, I also have to admit that up until now, um, these women have all been white, and behind every suddenly remembered white woman, there are likely to be legions of forgotten, marginalized people. So I also created these characters who are three narcissist flowers who live with the secretary. She gets a good deal on rent because they're considered a family unit. Um, they get a home, um, but they are very alienated from the building and also have a weird relationship with her. She kind of inserts herself into their narrative, so they leave to join a listed terrorist organization called the Rainbow Connection. <laughs> um, so the secretary became a way to address the archetype of the white feminist narrative, one that I belong to, that absorbs or over-identifies with narratives that give meaning to how they feel. And this is a great article um, by a writer called Doreen St. Felix. It's in The New Yorker, I believe. And it talks about the Me Too movement and how that was started, but how predominantly um, very wealthy white women who are actresses have become the mouthpiece of it and have really taken over that narrative. And the narcissist flowers have their own issues. I mean, they're narcissist flowers. And they grapple with the idea of a new network made up of unfixed identities and constant change. And I should be clear that these flowers are not meant to represent any group or individual person. They're very abstract in that sense. Um, there's also an actress called Gloria who confesses she feels there's no need to leave the house or the building and has not for over 10 years. She lives with her mother, who's played by an animated bird, whom um, she speaks to a lot about how her image as an actress is being circulated outside of the building beyond her control, and that the people are in a relationship with her image, which is something that she's not able to reciprocate. We have the time traveler, who left the building a long time ago, but is still very much in love with Gloria, um, who she left behind, and she's sending messages trying to get them into the building, they are being transmitted, or trying to transmit them into the building by a character called the manager, um, who's revealed to have been crushed by a piece of fitness equipment in the fitness center, uh, and has been given a speech mo module with which to communicate that he's used to hack into the building's network in order to start to make connections, to push the secretary to get it together, um, and also to get the time traveler's messages. So he was based on a lot of different things and people, um, but one thing I thought I'd bring up, because it's very inspiring, is um, Eric Valor, who has ALS, which is a debilitating condition. It's the same one that Dr. Stephen Hawking had. Um, so he's basically locked in his body. He has a speech module. And he noticed that there were severe limitations to tech support. <laughs> and he, being a former IT person, connected his speech module to the internet and started to travel to other people's speech modules, have regular conversations with them, um, but also help them to repair their modules. And this example, on a semi-smallish scale, is radical example of how alternative networks can be formed. This is a series, this is like a tweet storm that my friend Takeshi unleashed, um, which was about a popular story about how Google employees were protesting and walking out um, against the contract that Google had with the Pentagon. And he talks about the power that tech employees have. They're highly skilled, highly in demand, especially in a difficult job market, um, and that they really have the power to do something. So, Time Traveler's messages finally reach Gloria at the end of episode one. Unfortunately, her mother gets hit um, by one of the reflective rays in the solar panel system and gets fried, which is also sadly based on a true story. And we find ourselves at the start of episode two with the flowers continuing to negotiate what their responsibilities are. The time traveler and the manager are really pushing the secretary hard to let go of the narrative she's constructed and reconcile the difference between an idea of something and the reality of how that thing is lived in many different ways. The time traveler, who believes that the secretary is a missing link to reaching Gloria, succeeds in getting the secretary to split with herself, or at least with the idea of herself, and become something else, someone else. All the while, the mother's dead body transforms into a, a bacteria colony hanging out with Gloria. The architect weaponizes the weather to deal with an oncoming um, developer who wants to demolish the building. And eventually, Gloria chooses to be with her mother, 
and allows the bacterial storm to take over her body, just as the weaponized weather takes a turn for the worst. And this collision of the weather and the bacterial storm creates a cataclysmic event that um, the video refers to as the turn. So I should mention um, at this stage that uh, in episode one, um, everything, all the locations were live action locations. So I was fortunate enough to get to go around the world and film in some of these iconic buildings, sometimes with live actors, sometimes with actors that were keyed in um, or animated characters that were added later. But in episode two, um, I started to replace some of those live action locations with photorealistic set pieces that were made by a set fabricator. And as Amos's world breaks down, different realities and materialities emerge within the actual body of the video. So an early critique of episode one, which came out before episode two and three, um, was that they got what I was trying to do and the, you know, the cycle that I was critiquing, but they were wondering how was I not just going to hold a mirror up to that cycle and end up replicating it? How was I not just going to show people the thing that I'm saying is bad? And I really wanted to push this. So by episode three, everything was a reconstructed set piece and I opened the whole format up and we filmed it live in front of a studio audience across 13 hours. Every 20 minutes, a new audience would come in um, as we went through the taping. Um, and all of the characters continued to further complicate their identities and they were all working towards this idea of a solution, right? So I said I would do this, I would come up with an answer. Um, there's a role reversal as the secretary helps the time traveler who's struggling with the gap between her grief over her relationship and the reality that it never really existed. So this idea of displacement of feelings and memory and time. The manager confronts the architect whose design damaged his body um, and they have a conversation. The weather joins at some point. They push him um, into a very new emotion of humiliation. Uh, and something I was very happy to get to create, he steps down. He relinquishes power um, and gives a key piece of advice that helps the tenants move forward. And they embark on a speech at the end that's spoken directly to the viewers that offers a solution. The solution is vague. It's not particularly exciting. But I wanted to encapsulate, on the one hand, the momentous feeling that a solution is possible, but also the possibility that that solution won't be as interesting as it's been imagined to be or as it's been sold to us with terms like victorious or tremendous. As one of the characters says, it won't always be good like this. It may never even be great, but we will accept to work through these moments. We eventually accept the effort we make together is the best it will ever get. It expands. We don't recognize it anymore. The mess is strong. It is beautiful. Even when things are bad, there is the possibility that things will get better. Everyone deserves that. And I'll end discussing this project with something that happens at the tail end of episode one, where Gloria proposes that hope can be a means to resist the temptation of destruction. She says, hope is a kind of resistance. And Rebecca Solnit's Hope in the Dark, which is on the reading list, was something that very much influenced this. Um, she proposes hope as a kind of resistance and illustrates the actual, real, and difficult progress that is attained very quietly, in spite of and throughout hope's challenges. So as Gloria says, hope is a kind of resistance, but it can be exhausting. And if I have time, yeah, fantastic. Another thing that's really exhausting is making these works. <laughs> um, and um, it's with great pleasure to reveal to you that I definitely don't do this on my own. So this is um, a picture from the live taping of episode three. Um, where a lot, a lot of people worked on this project. And I was fortunate to work with large teams, um, so different animators that specialize in different kinds of software. Um, this is labor. So one of the biggest myths of our time is that technology is magic. It just appears out of nowhere. Um, but no, these people worked hard and I paid them fair wages. And that was something that was very important because it also helps other people get paid in the future. Um, how was it paid for? So as this is a school and it's also a very difficult time financially for many people, I thought it was important to talk about this for a moment. Um, instead of just commercial gallery or sales, 
There were 13 different museums and organizations that were involved in this project, each giving in different ways and levels. So this is just a way of distributing responsibility, which takes out a lot of stress for me. Um, and it also ensures that there's an audience, right? So that there's a payoff. A lot of people get to see the work, whether they like it or not. And on a practical level, that meant that there were different tiers. So there are producers, maybe institutions that have a bit more money to give, and then other ones that um, gave support uh, intellectually and in the research of the project and who gave a little bit and then um, would end up exhibiting so one of the sculptural works. I turned all of the set pieces into sculptural works, again, that broke down some of these themes. Um, and how I got them to do this is why it's actually really great to be in school. Um, even with my theater studies, I got this valuable skill of just being able to explain what I want and how that's going to happen, why it's important, specifically why I'm excited about it, which is usually what helps people get excited about working with me or working on it and making them a part of it. Um, and that's definitely something that's been developed. And I think in the beginning, it was just writing a lot of applications. So maybe I'd write 20 and two of them would pass through. But that's how it kind of started. Um, by the way, these are all uh, installation views from a show that opened a few weeks ago in Glasgow at a space called Tramway um, with all three episodes. I want to go back to something because it's so important, which is to pay people and to make sure that you get paid. Be kind, but be clear, because this is what can change the art world. I think the more that institutions get used to this idea that what we do is work, um, that even things like making sure that the work gets communicated properly, that's time that you put into it. And I know that in the beginning that's very hard and that's not always something that's realistic or possible. But I do just want you to very much bear that in mind. And I'll end this um, with this funny quote because uh, many different people have said this in different ways. I don't make exical films, I make films exically. So I don't make radical films, I make films radically. Jean-Luc Godard, the filmmaker, said that. I don't make political films, I make films politically. So instead of literally in the video telling you what my theory is or like explaining things directly, I prefer to take the ethics that I'm researching and that I believe in and put them in the actual production of the process because I believe that fundamentally that can be felt. Even if people don't know, it can be felt and it's pervasive in all of the work. And that's it, thank you. So we do want to open it up to some questions because we have time for questions. Are there any questions out there? There's a number of them. We'll start here and then I'll come over. Um, what advice would you give to artists, especially those early in their career, to help them advocate for themselves and make sure their work is acknowledged financially and otherwise? Totally. Make shows with your friends. Um, I was told that there are some project spaces here, uh, which is very cool and probably the best way to get started. That's definitely how I got started. Um, you can show work in your house. You can take photographs of it. You can put it online. You can put it in your website. When you apply for funds or for residencies, those are images that people will look at that give evidence that like, hey, I made something. You can trust me to like come and make more things. Um, so that's a really simple answer. Does that, does that make sense? Cool. And also, you never know who you or your friends are going to end up being. There's a lot of stuff that happens in the art world where it's like, there's a focus on contacting like this really important, super busy curator and getting their attention. But like, you know, they're going to retire at some point. And I think what becomes super interesting is to invest in conversations with the people around you and together to help elevate those conversations and help each other really rise up and become something, you know? So that it's like, oh gosh, like Denver, wow. Like everybody came from Denver in 2050, you know? Um, I, I do believe that's possible, but I'm an optimistic misanthrope. Um, so I'm a digital media creator, I'm a 3D animator, and so like 
from what I've seen from all the other like speakers and from what I've learned here is there's like two options between being a digital media creator and that is you either work for someone and do work that they've already created or you go out on your own and you invest in gallery spaces and invest in your own vision like what made you choose to go on your own vision instead of like getting a solid job that has a salary and you know like pays your bills and whatnot yeah, I mean, I've had lots of jobs. Like, I can show up to work. Um, so that that definitely would have been an option. But I think one of the things I loved about um, becoming a visual artist was that I don't have to choose what I do, really. If I want to make a play, I can make a play. If I want to make a movie, I can make a movie. Um, if I want to learn how to draw, I don't draw very well, but I could do that. Um, but to answer very honestly your question, um, I'm interested in so many different kinds of animation. So like for example in episode two of Amos's World, there's a software some of you might know called Houdini. Um, and the person I who I worked with, who's amazing, uh, he does just that. And I recognize that that is like a highly specialized skill. And I don't pretend to be anything other than an amateur and my job is to figure out as much as I can about what they do so that they can find out what I want and we can build that together. So I think for me, it was, it was a combination of skill, but also that like being a visual artist means I could also take a break for two years and get a job. That's not dramatic. Like there's this amazing artist, Elaine Sturtevant. Um, she started out repeating other artists' work and everyone kept saying like, oh, she's an appropriationist. And she was like, that's not what I'm doing. And she took a break for 13 years. She just passed away three years ago, and she is one of the most celebrated artists in the contemporary art scene. So, yeah, it's possible to do both. Life is long. Um, this question is in regards to your Agnes project. I'm here. Sorry. Oh, hey. <laughs> um, how do you differentiate between the artificial artificial intelligence and like Agnes as an avatar? Oh. Um, I always say that Agnes isn't an avatar because she doesn't have a body. She's very perplexed by this fact. Um, but I see what you mean. So like an actual artificial intelligence and um, an artificial artificial intelligence. So her in the performances and her um, on the website. I mean, she's kind of always an artificial artificial intelligence. And most um, AIs are, actually. Um, so they're pre-programmed. They have very limited data sets. Um, I, the way I like to describe her is um, she's almost like a video that happens, like a video edit that happens in real time. Um, and there's like kind of an endless, uh, like endless number of possibilities. So she's technically an AI in that sense, but not in that she doesn't learn anything, she doesn't get any smarter. Um, so it is mostly an artificial, artificial intelligence. And I should also be clear that the person doing all those interviews was me. It was just like a scripting exercise as Agnes. I think we have another one over here. Ah, oh yeah, sorry, just last thing. There was the option to actually make an AI, um, and I didn't do that because also as an artist, I didn't think it would be interesting to make something that people pressed a button and then they were like, wow, how did that happen, you know? And to make an artificial intelligence work, I think that would have taken like 10 years. Yeah. I'm a little nervous. Um, in terms of like, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very nervous. I'm not used to talking in a microphone, but. Um, You're fine. In terms of your animations, um, is there like a specific medium you prefer or like is comfortable with? Like, I don't know, CG, traditional, mixed media, all that jazz? That's actually a great question. So um, I am always looking for new kinds of animation. There's no one that I prefer. And in fact, for every project, I do a huge amount of research into like what's new, what's old, what are things I don't know about, because those start to inform the actual characters. So for example, the lovers from What the Heart Wants, um, so that's rotoscope animation, uh, similarly to what was used in A Scanner Darkly. Um, and that is very expensive and 
and takes a lot of time. And I actually got to work with someone from Black Cat Films um, who worked, who's part of the team that developed the software that did a scanner darkly. And she was like, yeah, this is basically what you can have. And I was like, I still want to do it. And in fact, I'll write this into the script. So the characters talk about their limited range of emotions because they've been sanctioned by the Ministry of Expressions. Um, and they say this kind of animation is very expensive. So like the flowers, um, that was a 3D model, but then the animator and I, we started to replace some of the textures by scanning petals, because we really wanted them to have this very, like, um, almost animalistic, translucent kind of quality. Um, the bird, of the mother, is 2D animation. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And I think this is also something that's very important to me, which is to recognize that, to some extent, animation and you know, digital work is kind of no different in painting, and that you have different tools, you have different materials. Like certain things necessitate, you know, an oil or an acrylic, in the same way that certain things necessitate Houdini. You know, and that's literally the only thing that this thing could be. Um, so I really hope that I can continue to just not limit myself and to not fall too in love with one thing. Yeah, I was just curious, because um, <clears throat> you reference Facebook a lot. You also do like apocalypse and robots and stuff. And so, like, what is your thoughts on how Facebook is constantly listening to us and sharing all our information with the internet and the world? Yeah, I think we should quit Facebook. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think Facebook's going to exist in 20 years. There's, like, a significant chance that the World Wide Web, which is, by the way, just one form of the internet invented by one person, um, that might not exist. Um, but in terms of that, I think it's always important, as, uh, as exhausting as it may seem and as overwhelming as it may seem, um, just learn as much as you can about what you can do to protect yourself so that you can still enjoy these things. I still use Instagram. Like, you don't have to read the terms and conditions. Just Google it. There's, like, instructions on how to turn off uh, location finding and things like that. And then the listening thing, I mean, that's, that's something political. I think we all need to start in our small ways. I don't know how, I live in the UK, it's a very small country. The United States is huge. Um, but from what I understand from my friends, it's like calling your representatives to ask for um, net neutrality and things like that. Um, I mean, I don't know how realistic that is, but I think if you start to work towards that, you learn more and more if you make that your hobby. Um, and I think also it's not a generational thing. So when I did the robot play, um, one of the institutions that showed it in Belgium, all of the um, museum guards were these women in their 70s, and they were so badass. Like, in the beginning, they were kind of like, oh, I don't know anything about technology, it's really scary, like, is this robot, you know, gonna push me over or something? <laughs> Um, and I was like, no, it's kind of like Skype. Like, you use Skype. Like, it was hard in the beginning. It doesn't always work. You kind of figure out how to fix it. And by the end, like, I feel like they knew more about these robots than I do because they spent, they just spent every day, some time every day with them. Um, we are smarter than these machines still for the moment. <laughs> All right. Um, I've been trying to ponder how I'm going to put this. So, in your video, you really show a couple of really awesome videos as far as the like skyscrapers that were trying to bottle people up into really like um, a concept of a town or a civilization, but just in one little bottleneck. Do you feel as though the internet in itself perpetuates that situation as an entity that the internet in its own person, in its own use is like a skyscraper, just packing people in, becoming a place that's almost un uh, maintainable, unable to become secure, where police don't want to go into it, like you had mentioned? Um, totally. I mean, that's the allegory, right? Yep. Um, and you could sub in a lot of stuff for that. And I think it's more... So these buildings, like, I would totally live in one. Some of them are really nice apartments. Um, but I think it's more the moment that people start to build an, an ideology into the aesthetic. So the moment that you start coding ways of living into these structures, 
and you start imagining a way of life for people. And specifically this language of what the genius creator has to offer that many people with just this one thing. Um, and I, I do think that there are ways that we could not repeat that. And I don't think it means necessarily starting something new. So if we're talking about the internet, I really wish, so like to go back to the Facebook thing, this is really wild and it's never gonna happen, but like whatever, let's all be happy for a second. You know, it's like um, people in the UK were talking about Twitter and how it was failing and how actually they should uh, break it off and sell the shares to the public so that it's a public owned entity. Or let's imagine a world where we have a government that we trust and these, um, sorry, bad joke. Uh, and these infrastructures are you know, a in a constant change. I mean, change is a huge part of it. Like when you have one dude and a bunch of people who love that dude and like, have sort of like pinned all of their hopes and dreams on that ideology, that's a massive rubberneck that you're up against. And I think also to go back to your question about learning, like, you know, how do we combat this and learning the tech, the more that we can have a constant update of ourselves and that we can continue to change and not have this fixed idea of like, I'm an Instagram person, I don't know how to use an iPhone, blah, 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 the more that we can get that control back from what the companies are already doing, which is like getting us used to this idea of constant change, but always a very branded change. Um, and I'll give a, one last very specific example. So Google, um, they've started this um, image database and they're running around to all the national museums and saying, we will do your archiving for you. Um, we will take pictures or we'll take your pictures and we'll archive them and put them in our database. So my issue, my question to them that I asked and they didn't really care for this was um, A, like, okay, you've, you've shown us St. Paul's Cathedral, but like when I encounter the beauty of St. Paul's Cathedral, you know, on their website, or, you know, when I actually go to it, I'm really encountering that. And now when I encounter it through your database, I have to pass through your aesthetic, your branding, and what you want from me in order to arrive finally at this, you know, at this cathedral. And then the second thing that I ask them is like, what happens when Google doesn't exist anymore? <laughs> like who owns these pictures and what do museums do? Um, so I think the more and more that we can start to learn how to do things for ourselves, the better, the better it'll be. Any last, I'll do one more on this side. Thanks. I, I'm just really interested in that, like what can we do for ourselves? And you had said um, you're interested in like who are gatekeeping these systems. And so I'm so interested in that individuality versus collectivity you were discussing. And so I also really like that you don't have exciting solutions or don't want to do that. So this might be a difficult question, but I'm interested in, in that, doing it for yourself versus looking into a collectivity, um, especially with things like in what the heart wants. This is a little specific question, sorry, that's bugging me. Did that character have like CV dazzle on the face that like artists like Adam Harvey, where you have like Which a weird character? haircut? The um, character in What the Heart Wants had like makeup on so her face couldn't be recognized. Oh yeah, so that's the rotoscope character. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm interested in like works like that where like hide your own face, cut your hair in a certain way so the, you know, the system can't see you and you take care of yourself in this kind of neoliberal way and you'll be fine. So yeah, like do it for, I'm just. Yeah, really so question. there's a great artwork by Hito Sterl called How Not to Be Seen, yeah. which deals with exactly this. So and this question, so what you're talking about is invisibility versus visibility. And I think it doesn't, it can't go either way, right? There are benefits to invisibility and there are also major downsides to invisibility. So I think again, it's about this like constant flux and always having, like I love the idea of unfixed identities. Um, because I think also like a major thing that the research in Amos's world forced me to start to imagine was just like, even a group is not really a group, you know? Like what is a group of men? What is a group of women? Like those are individuals that are all part of this arbitrary constructed thing. 
So instead of like working towards a single reality, how can we start to imagine multiple realities, all existing within one accepted framework that could change at any time? You know, I mean, I'm not advocating for nihilism, like that's dangerous and not fun, <laughs> um, except for the people doing it maybe. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I think that's what I'm most interested in and what I think my next project will be centered around is like, how do we redefine the collective in a way that's not fixed? Because I, I think that could be central and key to unlocking this. Um, because these structures have become so big that they are like unimaginable. And this gatekeeping, it's like, but what are you gatekeeping? Like, what is democracy really? What is neoliberalism really? you know, at this stage. Like, I, we understand what it is in a history book or in the Constitution, but like, and it's not about letting that go entirely either. Like, I'm, I also don't believe that, you know, these housing complexes should be torn down, but it's like, the infra like the architect at the end says, like, it's, it still has structural, it still has integrity. It still has structural integrity. These intentions are not bad. It's just like, how do we redistribute that power um, so that it isn't so fixed and so singular. Okay, I think we have to end it there. Can we give her another round of applause, everybody, please? Thank you. Thank you so much Thank for listening. Thank you so much, Cecile. Thanks. <laughs>